Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and we're doing the white glove treatment today because we're going to begin a series of videos about scanning old photographs into your computer and archiving them. It can be a daunting task, and I've got a couple of negatives here we're going to be playing with to do just that. Now, if you don't know what this is, uh, back in the days before digital photography, you used to take pictures with cameras on film. You would take the little film canister to the photo lab. Uh, they would develop that film for you, uh, make you a set of prints, but also give you back these negatives. And these are what they would use if you wanted to make an enlarged so a lot of times I would go and get my 3x5s or my 4x6s, uh, find the pictures that I wanted to make bigger, bring the negatives back, and they would give you larger format pictures. And this is really, if you're going to be archiving your old photos, uh, the best way to do it because you're going to pull out uh, the best possible quality image you can get, uh, which is what is uh, captured on these little strips of film. And this video is being sponsored by a company called Lasersoft Imaging, who are the makers of Silverfast. And their software is designed to do exactly uh, what we're about to do. Uh, before I knew them, I did a review of their software as part of a, a scanner that I was looking at from Plus Text. So you can check out that video linked above. Uh, but in this video, we're not reviewing the software. I'm showing you how to use it. Uh, and I actually believe uh, very, very truthfully that their software is the best uh, choice really to do what we're going to do here as far as uh, correcting and archiving negatives. It is a bit daunting though, because this company has been around for probably about 30 years or so since people have been uh, scanning digital images. They were kind of at the forefront of this entire industry. So there is so much stuff in this software that uh, it'll take us weeks to go through all of it. And it might just do, do that to get through everything. So in this video, I'm going to show you just how very uh, quickly you can get going with it uh, and how really inexpensive this process can be. And the scanner we're using today is a Canon 9000F Mark II that Lasersoft Imaging lent to the channel for this video. This scanner plus their Silverfast ASE software should run you less than $200. And this is a flatbed scanner, so it looks just like any other flatbed scanner you would play with, but uh, they also give you a, a little hopper here for loading, my air bottle's caught in there. Uh, they give you a little hopper here for loading in uh, negatives to scan. So you can't just put the negatives down on the flatbed scanner. You do have to load them in this hopper first. I'm gonna put a, a piece of uh, towel down here just so I don't uh, risk scratching these things. And what you wanna do is make sure that the shiny part of the negative is facing down when you put it in the hopper here. And uh, you'll know if you screw it up because if there are any words in the photograph that you're scanning, uh, those words will be backwards, basically kind of like a mirror image. So you can correct that in software or you can just load them in properly when you uh, go to put them in. So what you wanna do is just get them positioned properly in here in the hopper uh, and snap down the, uh, the little arm here to get them in. It's a little tricky sometimes, especially when you're trying to talk and do this at the same time. But once they're in there, it'll actually flatten out a little bit because they do tend to curve over time. So I'm going to put in this other row here and what's nice is that because we're doing this on a flatbed scanner, we can actually do a batch job, which you'll see in a second, and just get all of these scanned in at once. But you probably wanna spend a little bit of time uh, just reviewing the photographs first. And one thing I recommend you do before you put this in the scanner is uh, look very closely and make sure there's no dust resting on any of the negatives. And if there is, uh, the best way to get it off is with a little squeeze bottle, something like this that just blows air out. I do not recommend using uh, those compressed air bottles. That's the worst thing you could do because you don't wanna uh, shock these negatives negatives with very cold temperatures, which those things tend to uh, shoot out. Sometimes the propellant comes out with them too. So you just want something you can squeeze. Uh, there are better ones than the one I have here, but this is a, a good example saying if you can just blow the dust off the surface of these negatives because uh, these things are very tiny images really. They're very small uh, squares of images that are captured on these uh, film layers here and uh, you will pick up anything that's attached to them with the scanner because we're going to be scanning these tiny little squares at a very high resolution. So it's very much like uh, blowing up a photograph back in the old days. You should also make sure that the surface of the scanner is also clear of dust as well. And once you have all of that taken care of, uh, just close the uh, flat bed and we can begin uh, the scanning process. So I'm gonna switch over to my Mac here and uh, this is the Silverfast a desktop here. And as you can see, it's got a lot of stuff here that you need to look at. So we're going to step through really the quickest way to get going here. And the first thing I want you to do uh, is go over to the top here where you see the transparency negative 48 to 24 in frame. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just show you how I have this configured. So we are using transparencies, which are negatives. Uh, if you were using a print, you would just select reflective. So anything transparent, uh, select transparency. Uh, we have negative selected, but you can also do uh, a positive. So if you had you know, a slide, one of those little plastic slide things that are uh, you know, basically filmed, but they are positives, uh, you would select positive. But in this case, we're going to select negative because that's what we have here. I have it set to 24 bit right now. And uh, this is good for you know, using software to look at images for sharing with friends or whatever. If you plan on making huge prints, 
uh, you might want to consider doing the 48-bit color because uh, that will give, it's hard to explain, but there are um, gradients when you're looking at things like the sky where there's very subtle differences in the shade of blue. On 24-bit photos, if you are blowing them up really large, you might see some, uh, you know, kind of like a gradient going on that's not natural. So 48-bit is more colors, basically, more shades of color, essentially, uh, that will make your pictures look smoother. But for the most part, if you're usually relying on just looking at them on screen or just printing them out on a home printer, 24-bit uh, should be fine. But if you really want to future-proof your images, uh, do it at 48, but just know that it's possible that your um, your photos may not work on all software. A uh, frame here we're going to get to in a second after we begin our pre-scan because this is actually the really smart way, a very quick way to get uh, going with everything. So now you've got a very important decision to make and that is uh, what file format and at what resolution do you want to bring these photos in at? And this is a really critical decision because even if you are just planning to have these images live digitally and be looked at on screens, uh, remember just how much progress we've seen in the last two years or so on screen resolution. We've gone from you know sub HD displays to quad HD displays to 4K to 5K. Basically our display technology is like doubling or tripling in resolution a year. So you need to make sure that your photographs are at a high enough resolution to be able to be looked at on these displays without them looking all cloudy or pixely or blocky and everything. So you really want to bring in uh, the best possible resolution you can based on what scanner hardware you have and pick the right file format to do it. So let's look at what our choices are there. I prefer the TIFF format, T-I-F-F. -F. It has been around forever. It will likely be around forever. And what this is, is a lossless image format, which means that uh, when you scan the image, every pixel the scanner sees will be saved in the file. If you use something like JPEG, which I know a lot of our digital cameras use, uh, that actually takes that initial image and then compresses it. It takes things out of the picture uh, to make the image smaller. Normally you don't see those things with your eyes, but you may not see it with your eyes on a current display, but you might see it on a display down the road. So you really want to take these images and archive them, again, at the best possible resolution possible. So stick with TIFF. You could also choose a Photoshop PSD if you want. That is also lossless and you could bring uh, that into Photoshop. But again, both of these formats, actually all, all of these formats here will work with uh, Photoshop, but I would suggest doing TIFF to start. Uh, you also want to choose where those images will be saved. So after we're done with our little exercise here, we're going to have a bunch of images saved on the hard drive. And what we're going to do here is just select where they're going to go. So I'll just go into my uh, pictures folder here and I'll just type in new folder and we're going to call this uh, image scans. And this is where our images will be saved to when we are done. So we'll just save them in there and select that folder. By the way, I'm using a Mac for this, but this is identical on Windows also. So the same uh, interface is on both the Mac and on Windows. So another important decision here is what size of photograph do we want to scan in? So remember these uh, negatives are these little squares on those uh, film strips and we need to blow them up. Again, very similar to what a photo lab may have done 20 or 30 years ago. You're doing here within your scanner because unlike a digital photograph, which has kind of like the uh, max you could zoom it in on, uh, film is very different. You can zoom in uh, very tightly because there's a lot of resolution packed into those uh, film strips. Now, depending on your scanner, uh, you will get different degrees of quality depending on how far you zoom in. So you're really limited by your scanner optics. So I want to show you what happens here. Now you're going to notice that right now our output is set to 1.4 inches by 0.94 inches. That is pretty much the native size of the negative we're about to scan. And this is what the print size would be uh, if we were to print it out right now, which obviously would be too small. Now remember, negatives have a lot of uh, data essentially baked into them because this is film, so we can adjust this. So I'm going to make this a larger print. Maybe I'll go up to 11 inches here. And as you'll see here, it automatically gets the aspect ratio correct so we don't have to adjust both values here. You can just change one of them. So if I go back to uh, that one inch thing there, you'll see that 0.66 adjusts automatically. And if I go to 11, it will then go 11 by 7.31. And uh, you'll notice up here that as we're adjusting this, this resolution slider is changing. And uh, you'll see that it has a zone here for uh, the resolution of the scanner. So this is really the sweet spot here for the scanner right in the middle. What this represents is what our scanner is capable of scanning. So we are using a low cost scanner here. So the optics on this one are not going to be as good as a industrial laser drum scanner that could go to maybe 2000% or something. Uh, this one is probably at its sweet spot here uh, right in the middle. So as you get into the red zone, uh, you start to degrade image quality. So even though your 
scanner might advertise itself as like 4,800 PPI or whatever. Uh, optically, what it's really capable of doing is lower than that. And often they do some software tricks within its hardware to make it a higher resolution. But for the purposes of scanning these little negatives in, I think you want to be safe and kind of put it right in the middle. So if you spend more money on your scanner, uh, you can push this further. All right, we're going to get ready to do the fun stuff, which is bring in a pre-scan now to bring those negatives back to life here on our computer. But before we do, I want to point you into the preferences directory uh, because although our first scan is going to be a very quick one, uh, there is something we're going to want to do later. And uh, bringing in a high resolution pre-scan, you can see I have mine set to 8x right now, uh, will actually make the workflow a little bit faster uh, when we get to doing some of the things we're going to do later. So we'll go into preferences in your general section and set that high resolution pre-scan to 8x. And you'll thank me later because it will make your workflow a lot faster. So now I'm going to click that pre-scan button and our scanner is going to go out and convert those negatives into to positives again after, in my case here, probably almost 20 years. Uh, so we're going to let the Canon scanner here do its thing. And uh, in a second or two, we'll see those images appear on our screen here. So let's see what happens. All right, I sped up time because it was a slower scan due to that high resolution pre-scan. Now what we need to do is find our frames so we can get the proper color on them. You can see only one of them right now uh, is lit up here essentially. So I'm gonna go over to the frame option here. Uh, go over to find frames and we're going to tell it that we have a film strip 35 millimeter holder and when i click on that it's going to go and look at what we just brought in uh, do a little bit of thinking and in a second or two it should be able to find all of the frames that we just scanned in and you can see now uh, all of those have been selected and it's uh, doing its automatic color processing on them and now we have individual frames here uh, automatically detected if for some reason it doesn't grab the whole thing or it gets a, a little bit off uh, you can go in here and just adjust it a little bit to drag it out uh, the rest of the frame length. Sometimes it doesn't always get it perfectly, but uh, there you go. Most of these look like they came in just fine. Uh, and what I'm gonna do now, even though these are upside down, we'll deal with those later. So now what we're gonna do is go up to the scan icon here and we're gonna click and hold on it. Instead of scanning, we're going to go to batch scan. And what that's going to do is bring in high resolution versions of all seven of these negatives onto my hard drive as TIFF files. I'm going to tell it where to put those, uh, those photos. I'm going to click on scan. And in a few minutes, we will have uh, some very large high resolution files of these negatives. All right, our scanning process is done. You can see how fast you can do it if you don't really want to do anything to the pictures. You can just have the auto frame find work, hit that batch scan, and they'll all uh, get scanned in at full resolution as separate files. We now have seven large TIFF files of about 30 megabytes apiece. Uh, but you can see how nice this one came out. This is a 20 year old negative uh, that came in. It actually looks better than the print that I got from the photo lab at the time that I took the picture. So uh, it doesn't look too bad there at all. This is my college dorms courtyard from my freshman year. I'll scroll th through a few more here. We're gonna do uh, exposure and color correction in a future video, uh, but you can definitely see some blemishes up here that we may wanna deal with. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I'll scroll through a few more here. We can see some differing exposures that I took on some of these photos here. And on this photo of my uh, now unfortunately late dog, this is when she was a puppy, uh, we have some scratches down here as well and, as, and some dust maybe over here too. So this is where you really wanna check your negatives before you uh, put them in the scanner to make sure there's no dust on the negative and also no dust on the scan head. Now normally what you might think about doing is just bringing these into Photoshop to edit them, which you can do. Uh, but one of the things that the Silverfast software has is some uh, automated tools to find those scratches and get them out before you even have to edit anything. And it actually works exceptionally well. All right, so we're gonna go back to the film strip mode now. I did put in a couple of black and white negatives I was playing around with earlier. And what we're gonna do is select a dog photo again and zoom in on it so we can get a better view of what we're looking at here. Now what we're gonna do is run something called ISRD and uh, many scanners that are compatible with the Silverfast software also have a uh, infrared light that they can shine on the film. This works best with color photos. We'll show you what to do with black and white in a minute. And when you click on that ISRD button, you're going to get a dust and scratch removal option showing up on your left-hand side navigation. What we're gonna do here uh, is click on the one-to-one. -one, and what this is going to do is pass over the image again now with an infrared light. And what that's going to do is find any of the physical blemishes that are on the film itself and uh, we'll, it'll correct those things automatically. And once this finishes, this does take a few, uh, probably about a minute or two for it to go through. Once this finishes, we'll come back and I'll show you how to fine tune this adjustment. Okay, our infrared scan is done and I want you to keep an eye on a couple of things here before I implement the corrections. We have a spot here, a scratch there, another little scratch there. I'm going to go over into the corner here on the ISRD 
a scratch removal area on our navigation panel. I'm going to switch this from original to automatic, which is basically the autopilot mode of this correction. And what it's gonna do is look at what it got off the scanner and get rid of a lot of the things that it picked up with its infrared scan. So you can see there's a bunch of dust there. Uh, if I go back to the original image, you can see that it really does take care of a lot of these physical blemishes on the negative, especially the ones that are uh, scratches that uh, show up on there. So physical damage, it does a very nice job of correcting. You'll see a, an extreme example of that in a minute, but it really does uh, do a pretty nice job here of capturing things that are problematic and removing them without having to do a lot of extra effort in another program. And that's kind of the advantage of uh, using the software here. Now there are some fine tuning adjustments you can make with this also. So right now this is in automatic mode. We're running on the AI Studio version of the software that gives us more options, but even on the SE edition, there are some fine tuning settings you can do. So I'm gonna switch this over into the mark mode real quick. And what this mode does is it shows you what it found in its infrared scan. So all these red lines and dots here are potential physical blemishes that were detected by the software. And as I adjust this detection meter down, you'll see those areas get a little bit finer uh, or get a little bit more numerous because it gets a little less uh, picky about what it decides is a blemish versus not. So if you are seeing your image softening up a little bit, you can go into this mode, adjust the detection settings and see exactly what it finds so you can uh, really make a fine tuning adjustment. Now more advanced versions of the software like the AI Studio version we're running here will have different options for greater fine tuning. So on uh, this one here, we have an option for uh, this expert setting mode here and it will, this will give us some more fine tuning for the image. So you remember I mentioned that you don't wanna have a lot of these red dots around here. We really wanna have uh, just the areas that need correcting uh, kind of being focused on by the software. So I'm gonna turn down the detection level a little bit and you'll see a lot of those red dots start to go away. But in the process of doing that, my scratch gets a little bit less red on it and I want actually more red on that. Uh, so the expert settings on some of the more advanced versions of the software will give you some additional options to play with here, including the size of the detection area. So you can see as I'm moving this de uh, defect size lever over, uh, it's filling back in uh, that scratch. So we're able to not impact too much of the rest of the image here. So we can kind of adjust this down a little bit more perhaps and get everything just the way we want it. I can also uh, extend this too and uh, make this a little, you know, have it cover a little bit more real estate on the negative also as we're doing that. So you can really start fine tuning things uh, when you get into the mix of all of this uh, with a more advanced version of the software. So when you really start getting serious about this, this might be something uh, worth considering. You also have, and I'll show you this in a different uh, mode in a second, uh, the ability to mask off certain areas too and have uh, different areas treated differently than others in order to really get this fine-tuned to the way you want. And those are some of the advantages of going up to more advanced versions of the Silverfast software. All right, here's a little before and after. The before is on the right, the after is on the left. You can see here it got rid of a lot of the things that uh, it found in the photograph. And this is just with the automatic settings that you'll see on the SE version of the software. So that scratch here is pretty much gone on this side. All that dust and stuff is gone too, uh, as is that big spot in the middle between her ears. Even a scratch on her uh, head there was taken care of as well. So this really does the best with the physical scratches, but it's also very effective at dust also. Pretty much anything that infrared scanner uh, can pick up, it will make an effort to adjust and save yourself a lot of time in the post-production side of your photo processing. I also wanted to show you an example of a really damaged negative uh, that is really benefiting from this uh, infrared repair. So if I click on uh, that one-to-one -one like we did before, you can see just how much stuff uh, when you have some real physical damage beyond just dust that it's able to uh, pick up and correct when uh, the negative is really damaged. So it does a pretty good job here, as you can see, uh, getting rid of a lot of things that it can detect on the surface of your negative. All right, now I have a black and white negative loaded up because we're going to try the software scratch detection and uh, the infrared version is not compatible with black and white negatives because it has a high silver content and the scanner really can't uh, detect anything with the infrared light, so we have to rely on software. Now you're gonna see there's a big scratch here, uh, not on my beloved Ford Probe here from 1993, but on the negative itself. And I'm just going to go ahead and turn on the correction here so you can see uh, how well it finds it and gets rid of a good chunk of it actually. And if I go into the mark section here, uh, you can see now that uh, it is actually seeing mostly just that scratch. A couple of other little artifacts here or there. Uh, but there are some things we can do if we really want to just localize this, uh, we can. Now this right now is working uh, with its basic feature. This is what you'll find on the, uh, the SE version. But if you wanted to do more localized correction of an image, you can use some masking tools that is found in the AI version. So what I'm going to do real quick here is just draw a little mask around this scratch because we're going to do a little bit more work on it. I don't want it to detect 
uh, this area either because it's picking up some of the reflection on the molding there. So I'm just going to draw the circle around this. And what you'll see is all those other red dots are going to go away um, because what we're going to see here is that just this masked area is being impacted by the changes now. So I could actually draw additional masks all over the place uh, and have everything kind of work differently in each of those little masks that I have selected. So you really do get a lot of fine control here. Now a couple other things I want to do is I want to get that, uh, that, that detection area kind of expanded a little bit here. So I have a tool also in the AI version that allows me to kind of draw in a little section here and what it'll do is if I keep going over that area, it'll add additional detection dots here and try to correct that scratch a little bit better. Uh, likewise, I can use the eraser tool here. Maybe I'll make it a little bit smaller. I'm using my trackpad here, so I don't have the best precision at the moment, but I can go through here uh, and go over this a couple of times and get back some of that reflection also by removing uh, some of the detection of uh, that, that white area. So you can see those, those red dots are going away the more I go over it here, and eventually that uh, entire area will come back to us here. So you may just spend a little bit of time on this to get it uh, just right, but the fact that it can kind of pick that up just via software algorithms uh, I think is pretty impressive here. So you can see that scratch is uh, getting better and better. I might want to uh, add a little bit more detail over in that section also so I can just draw in a little bit more here. And again, I'm not being the most precise person in the world right now, but you can get an idea as to how this works. So uh, you can keep kind of going over areas and uh, add areas and remove areas as you go. And again, we're only impacting this general vicinity here uh, because that is where we drew the mask. And I scanned in both the original and the corrected version here, and you can see that the one on the left uh, is significantly less scratched than the one on the right. So it really can uh, do a pretty good job of getting rid of this stuff uh, with software algorithms very quickly without a lot of effort. So that's how it works, and if you have a flatbed with one of those uh, negative uh, trays, it actually is pretty efficient because you can, again, go in, get a bunch of photos set up, you can scan six or seven or eight of them at a time, maybe even more depending on what you can fit into that tray. Uh, start it up, let them scan, come back when it's done, and you'll have uh, all your images ready to be loaded into your photo software for further editing or for archiving, so pretty efficient there. Uh, so it's not all that expensive, again, to get it in the door, so you can go up to uh, the AI version, which I believe is $299 to be able to get that masking feature and some of the other fine-tuning settings for uh, doing all of those software-based corrections. Uh, but you really can do a lot with the entry point as well, and I really do like the efficiency, again, of having that flatbed uh, taking care of multiple images at the same time insofar as scanning them in and working on them. So it's a little bit faster uh, than loading them in individually, which is pretty nice. So that is our initial introduction for the ingest. We're also going to be looking a little bit more at color correction using Silverfast. I think we're going to bring on somebody from Silverfast to kind of walk us through uh, some more advanced features of the software moving forward. So we'll be looking at that and then I think we'll also do something on archiving and storage because I, I asked a lot of people what they were doing to store their photos and a lot of people are still just putting them in folders and not actually using anything. So we're going to look and see uh, what's available out there right now for organizing your photos and we'll look at it from the perspective of a couple of different computing platforms too to figure out what might work best for every scenario. This is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters, including Gold Level supporter Shabib. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.